testing the flat earth model. Well, it's not actually a model. There is no working theory behind this. Not even a hypothesis. As far as I can tell this is just an idea. A whole lot of baseless claims built on a map and some animations. The claim is that every government in the world, NASA, and the Freemasons is lying. Everyone working in space industry, every pilot and sailor, all astronomers, every land surveyor and meteorologist, and all scientists in the world is in on the lie, and they are lying about everything. The shape of the world, outer space, and gravity. In fact every discipline of science and common knowledge is claimed to be a big fat lie. The earth is a flat and stationary disk. The moon and the sun are 50 kilometers in diameter. They orbit the north pole at an altitude of about 5000 kilometers. Seasons vary as the sun moves between the tropics. The earth is covered in a dome, a firmament. And, space and gravity don't exist. The map they're using is an asymutal equidistant projection, centered on the North Pole. In their laziness they've just picked a map from Wikipedia, but failed to link to the pages with the explanation, or credit the author of the map. If you look up the Wikipedia article you will find there is another asymutal equidistant projection, centered on the South Pole. In these maps all points in the world are at proportionally correct distances from the center point. For ham radio enthusiasts, these can be useful, if you have a map centered on your location. Here is a map centered on my hometown. You can make your own map centered on any place in the world. Land masses further away from the center get very distorted on this kind of maps. All maps are a compromise, as they are trying to show the surface of a sphere in two dimensions. This is a Mercator projection, which is distorted at the poles where the land masses are highly exaggerated. On this map, Greenland is about five times larger than reality, compared to for example the US. But this type of map is actually the best for navigating the seas. This map is a variant of Mercator, that tries to remedy some of the discrepancies in sizes, but does so by distorting land masses at the poles. But this is maybe the most natural way to view the world on a flat surface. So how do we know that the polar azimuth equidistant projection is not the correct representation? We know, Africa don't look like this, but much more like this. We also know Australia don't look like a road kill, but like this. Then there is the obvious. We know the circumference from South Pole to South Pole is 40,008 kilometers. We also know the distance around the world along the equator is 40,075 kilometers. So, the diameter of the flat earth disk must be 40,008 kilometer. The diameter of the equator is half the diameter of the disk, 20,004 kilometer. That means the circumference is, 20,004, multiplied with pi. Ask anyone who have circumnavigated the world if the circumference of the equator is 63,000 kilometers. I can tell you firsthand, even if you sail this route around the world, you are still only racking up about 50,000 kilometers. That is why the polar azimuth equidistant projection is absolutely useless for navigating around the world. Throughout history, maps have been important and man have tried their best to make representations of the oceans and lands they know. Maps are information and information is power. Maps have been important for navigation and trade, war and conquest. To assume people were smarter or stupid in ancient times, would be a gross mistake. They simply did not have the accumulated amount of information we have today. But looking at artifacts like the Antikythera mechanism, it can be no doubt the makers of the mechanism must have realized the heliocentrical model. True enough it displays the earth at the center, but to make the display understandable you will have to. Not only did they get the movements of all known planets mechanically correct, including retrogrades. They even, through genius gearing replicate the elliptical orbit of the moon, and the slow precession of the moon we call the animalistic month.
The Greeks knew that Earth was round, not flat, but they had no idea how big the planet is until about 240 BC, when Eratosthenes devised a clever method of estimating its circumference. Eratosthenes had heard from travelers about a well in Syene with an interesting property. At noon on the summer solstice, the sun illuminated the entire bottom of this well, without casting any shadows, indicating that the sun was directly overhead. So Eratosthenes hired the Mattists, professional surveyors who was trained to walk with equal length steps, and found that Syene lies 5,000 stadia from Alexandria. Eratosthenes then measured the angle of a shadow at noon on the summer solstice in Alexandria, and found it made an angle of about 7.2 degrees, or about 1 50th of a complete circle, so he could calculate the circumference to 250,000 stadia. 40 stadia is just under 4 miles, 3.915 miles to be accurate. If we convert from stadia to miles that gives us 24,665 miles. That is 391 miles shorter than the true polar diameter, or about 1.6% error. This is the kind of observational skills you need to observe the world and make sense of what you observe. The general problem with the proponents of the flat earth idea is that they don't have the mental capacity to see the fault in their own observations, like this clown, who thinks he is viewing the moon and a radar dome at the same angle, because they are both in his camera at the same time, failing to understand he must view the dome, from, this position to see them at the same angle. This is a simple observation anyone can do, by offering up a ball next to the moon, when it is visible in daylight. Depending on the surface properties of your ball, the shadow will look somewhat different, but it will always fall on the same side and angle as it does on the moon. When we are testing the flat earth model, we must use the same principle of observable facts. Simple repeatable observations. Known as amoth and elevation. Of the sun, moon and stars. Factual distances on the ground. Understanding what and how we are observing. Understanding simple physics and math. Basic understanding of optics and refraction. This animation show the disk with the sun and moon orbiting the north pole. The sun and the moon are exaggerated about 8 times for clarity. Despite some valiant effort by some flat earthers, this model cannot in a believable manner account for how we see the sun and the moon at the same time occasionally, nor can it model a lunar or solar eclipse. Apart from these issues we immediately spot another problem. We know the sun light up exactly half the earth. How does light reach these areas, unless there are some giant celestial lamp shade we don't know about? On the heliocentrical model this is of course no problem as the sun lights up exactly half the globe. If the sunlight only reaches so far, how does it reach the moon over here? Just by looking at the moon in a decent telescope, you can clearly see light and shadow in the craters on the surface. These shadows correspond with the direction of the sunlight and the shadow that makes the moon phase. By doing the experiment described earlier, where you hold a sphere up to the moon when it is visible in daylight, you can even see for yourself that the moon is lit up by the sun. We can also do spectrometry on the light from the moon, and find that the moon is made up of minerals. Spectrometry are slowly becoming so affordable, even amateur astronomers analyze and determine the composition of the moon's surface. If the moon is circling above the earth, between the tropic of Cancer and Capricorn, how does everyone, from every angle see the same side of the moon, and how does everyone see the same moon phase, and why is the moon upside down south of the equator? Yes it is, upside down in relation to what we see north of the equator, how do you account for that on a flat earth? In the heliocentric model this is not a problem, because we all look at a moon that is tightly locked to the earth, and it is about 384,000 kilometers away and we are on a globe. How does the sun light up exactly half the world? How does sunlight reach the moon? 
Why do we see the same side of the moon from all places? How do everyone see exactly the same moon phase? Why is the moon upside down south of the equator? Before we continue we have to deal with the matter of refraction. Refraction of light happens as it travels between mediums of different densities. Like light passing through a slab of glass. As the light hit the boundary the light waves are slowed down. When the light hits at an angle, different parts of the waves will be slowed down at different points in time. And the light will bend towards the smaller angle. Passing from glass back into air, the light will speed up. And the light will bend away from the smaller angle. The science of optics was founded by Isaac Newton in the 1660s, and has since been refined and is a well documented science, and is the basis for optics and camera lenses, reading glasses and many other things. Here's a simple experiment you can do, with a lens of known focal length. If you have a lens but don't know the exact focal length, you can fire a small laser perpendicular to the lens at different points and measure the focal length. Take the lens out into the sunlight and observe the distance to the focal point. If the incoming light is not parallel, the focal point will fall short of the focal length and we must have a close sun. If however the distance to the focal point matches the focal length, the incoming light is parallel and we have a distant sun. The optical properties of the atmosphere is also well known and we can calculate refraction in the atmosphere if we know all the properties like temperatures and humidity at different altitudes. The problem is obtaining or predicting what conditions are present. The changes in density in the atmosphere are gradual, so the bending of light will be gradual and curved. That is why refraction is somewhat elusive and difficult to make out based on for example a photograph. As a general rule light will always bend down since denser air will be at the bottom. When we are looking at an object like the sun, at a high elevation there is no refraction of the light. But looking at the sun as it gets closer to the horizon the light will bend towards the denser air, and the sun will appear to be slightly higher than it actually is. The bending of light is progressively larger closer to the horizon and may affect distant objects on the ground, making them appear higher or even revealing objects that are hidden. This kind of refraction falls in the category of mirages. Mirage We divide mirages into two types, superior and inferior. Mirages may occur when we have relatively large variations in air temperature and density close to the ground. These conditions is often found over oceans or in deserts where there are rapid heating or cooling off the boundary layers. Light from an object on the ground may be refracted downwards, making an object appear higher than it is. This type of mirage is called a superior mirage. Sometimes the ground or ocean can rapidly heat up the air, effectively trapping boundary layers off warmer air close to the ground. The warmer air will bend the light up, mirroring the image and creating what we call an inferior mirage. The combination of these refractions can make very strange optical phenomenon, like an oasis appearing in the desert miles away from where it actually is, or a car driving upside down in the distance and boats hovering over the horizon. Have a look at this image taken at Maple Bluff on the 18th of December, 2016. Compared to this one taken on the 22nd of December, I also recommend watching this video in full length of a ship turning into a flying Dutchman as it goes over the horizon. So how much refraction are we talking about? Less than one arc minute at 45 degree elevation. One arc minute is like looking at a soccer ball at 756 meters or 827 yards. The refraction increase progressively to 35 arc minutes or half a degree at the horizon. For comparison the moon has an average size of 31 arc minutes, so the entire moon can be visible even if it is behind the horizon. The model claims the sun and the moon orbit about 5000 kilometers above ground, 
So let us test this with some observations and simple trigonometry. We make observations at midsummer, at noon GMT in the northern hemisphere, when we know the sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, shown here in a purple line. Our first observation is done in London, where we find the sun at about 179 degrees, and at 62 degrees elevation. This will put the sun directly over Borj Baji Mokhtar, Algeria, at an altitude of 5,859 kilometers. Our second observation is done in Jerusalem where we find the sun at about 208 degrees, and at 81 degrees elevation. This puts the sun over Toshka Lakes in Egypt, at 6,367 kilometers altitude. The last observation is done in the Azores in the city of Ponte del Garda, where we find the sun at about 143 degrees, and at 73 degrees elevation, this places the sun off the coast of Dakla in West Sahara, at 7,394 kilometers altitude. Three observations of the sun from three different locations at exactly the same time, and we find the sun above three different places at different altitudes. If you continue to make observations you continue to get new locations and heights for the sun. There are something completely wrong with this model. On a globe this is however no problem, as all these observations point parallel straight to the sun, thus proving a globe, and a distant sun. Refraction above 45 degrees will be less than 1 60th degree. Refraction will not move the sun sideways. How is the sun at three different locations and heights at once? Why do we see the same face of the sun from all sides? Why is the sun upside down south of the equator? We're going to take a closer look at sunsets in the flat earth model, but first we have to establish some facts. The sun's apparent diameter vary from 31 arc minutes 45 seconds to 32 arc minutes 53 seconds due to the elliptic path of the earth around the sun. That is a variation of about 1 arc minute, or 1 60th of a degree, or about 3%. The sun can however appear larger as it sets above the horizon. This is not due to refraction, but the phenomenon called Ponzo illusion, where the sun on the horizon appear to be larger than when it is higher in the sky. Sometimes haze and clouds can also make it difficult to make out the exact size, but if we measure accurately we find that it is the same diameter. Measuring the apparent size of the sun with a normal camera is almost impossible. First of all you need to use a special sun filter, of around 16.5 f-stops, or ND100,000. The ND filter will make it possible to see the exact diameter of the sun. Second, remember that popular consumer cameras like say, the Nikon P900, actually only have a 350mm lens. It is due to the tiny sensor of 1 over 2.3 inch we get the 2000mm equivalent zoom. That's half the size of the sensor in a DJI Pocket 2, and one quarter the resolution. To achieve any quality the camera uses computational correction to compensate for distortion and dispersion of light due to poor quality lenses. Just refocusing will cause a shift. In zoom, in lenses like this, by all means, it is a decent consumer camera, but it is not an optical instrument. To get a lens with this zoom range, we are talking about broadcast quality lenses costing a couple of hundred thousand dollars. What you should be using is of course a heliometer, or a small, good quality celestial telescope if you want to take pictures. We are going to look at the sun from Mexico the 21st of September at noon, and then at 1700 hours. This is one hour before sunset when the sun is at 10 degree elevation, but we will also look at the sun as it sets. Then, when it is 5 p.m. in Mexico it is midnight in long year being on Svalbard in Norway, where the sun should be at minus 11 degrees, in other words below the horizon. Finally we move on to midnight the 22nd of December in long year being 
when the sun should be at minus 35 degrees. We try these observations on the flat earth model. The first observation is made in Tapachula in Mexico at noon in September. Where we find the sun at 75.5 degrees. Calculated distance is 6,617 kilometers and apparent size of the sun is 26 arc minutes. We use the calculated height of the sun from this observation for the rest of these observations. We then move on to 5 p.m. According to this model the sun is now set, even though it doesn't set for another hour. Anyway, in this observation according to the model, we find the sun at 40 degrees elevation. A distance to the sun of 9,974 kilometers and apparent size of 17 arc minutes. At half past 6 p.m. the sun should be below the horizon. In this model we find the sun at 33 degrees elevation. At 11,683 kilometers distance. Which give an apparent size of almost 15 arc minutes. But look, the azimuth of the sun is 308 degrees. According to real world observations the sun sets at 270 degrees. At 5 p.m. in Mexico, it is midnight at Svalbard and the sun should not be visible. In this model we find the sun at 28 degrees elevation. The distance to the sun is calculated at 13,641 kilometers. Apparent size of the sun is about 12 and a half arc minutes. The polar night and long year being lasts from the 26th of October to the 23rd of February. At midnight the 22nd of December the sun should be 35 degrees below the horizon. In this model we find the sun at 23 degrees elevation and a calculated distance of 15,979 kilometers. The apparent size of the sun is almost 11 arc minutes. None of the observations match real world observations. So this model don't hold much promise. The claim is that the sun sets due to perspective, apparent size, and some unexplained refraction. So, the sun is set and not visible from Mexico at 40 degrees elevation at a distance of 9,974 kilometers. Remember that later when we start calculating distances to the stars. On a globe however the sun set just work, because of reasons. The apparent size of the sun will never be less than 7 and a half arc minutes, or about 6 times bigger than Venus at its closest. The sun will never be below 10 degrees in this model. At this height refraction will be less than 1 tenth of a degree. How can the sun be at 23 degrees elevation at midnight midwinter? Contrary to observation, the sun vary greatly in size. How does sunset actually happen on a flat earth? Here's an experiment you can do. First you must make a simple instrument for measuring the angle of the sun. Make yourself a piece of cardboard with degrees from 0 to 90 degrees marked out, like this one. Attach your piece of cardboard to a stick of wood. Use a paper pin, or a small nail to attach a string in the focal point of the protractor, and tie a plumb bob, or just a key ring at the other end of the string, as shown here. You can attach the wooden stick to a camera tripod, or something adjustable like a pantograph lamp for ease of use. Now, go to any solar calculator on the web and find the elevation for the sun where you are. Find the elevation for two observations, one at noon, and one in the morning or afternoon. Take your instrument outside and align the stick directly towards the sun, to read the angles at the time of your observations. Whatever you do, do not look directly at the sun. You can hold a sheet of paper at the end of the stick, and verify that it does not cast a long shadow. The shadow should be approximately the size of the end of the stick. Read the angle on your cardboard protractor. At the time of your next observation, adjust the stick towards the sun, and read the angle on your cardboard protractor again. The solar calculator is based on the heliocentric model. If both observations match the numbers from the solar calculator, the Earth is a globe. If the Earth was flat, one or both observations would be completely wrong.
in the flat earth model, seasons shift as the sun moves from the tropic of Cancer to the tropic of Capricorn, shown in purple lines on this map. It is the proximity to the sun that caused temperature variation. As the sun moves to the outer tropic the south receives more sun and the south pole is bathed in midnight sun. The north is left in a polar night until the sun starts to return, and the north have its turn flooded in light. But there is a problem. As the sun moves to the south, all of the south pole is supposed to see the sun day and night. So how does light reach these areas? On a globe this is not a problem, as the 23.4 degree tilt of the earth exposes the south pole to the sun. This tilt alternately exposes the north and the south to direct sunlight as the earth moves around the sun throughout the year. We get summer in the south and winter in north when we're on the one side of the sun, and vice versa when on the other side. Let us take a look at how this works on a globe. This is Oslo, close to where I live. In the summer the light strikes down at 53.55 degrees. While in winter the light falls in at a mere 6.79 degrees. This means the same light is spread over an area 6.7 times larger in winter, and that any given area only receives about 15% light energy compared summer. This fits perfectly with observations on the ground. So let us try this in the flat earth model. We know the distances from Oslo to each of the tropics, so this can be done with simple trigonometry. At an elevation of 53.55 degrees the distance to the sun is 6831 kilometers on the 22nd of June. On the 22nd of December, using the same height of the sun this distance is 10760 kilometers. But, wait a minute, the elevation, according to the model is 30.71 degrees. This does not fit observations. But let us try this in our graphical representation. Light falling at 30.71 degrees will cover an area about 1.7 times compared to the 53.55 degrees of June. This means any given area receives 64.1% light. But we had a difference in distance from the sun. The difference is 10,760 divided with 6,831 kilometers, which comes out as a factor of 1.57. Using the inverse square law to calculate the difference in light we find winter to receive 0.4 the light of summer. We then multiply this value with the 64.1% due to angle and find the received light in winter is 25.6% of what we get in the summer. 25.6% is not consistent with observations, neither is an elevation of 30.71 degrees for the sun. This is the correct number, the model is wrong. There is another glaring problem with the model, the circle of the tropic of Capricorn is 1.75 times longer than that of Cancer. The sun will have to speed up by a factor of 1.75 as it drift out to the larger circle. Are we to believe the sun is doing 1200 miles per hour around the tropic of cancer, almost 2000 kilometers an hour, and then accelerate to over 2000 miles, or 3300 kilometers per hour as it moves out to the tropic of Capricorn? How does this happen? This is the opposite of conservation of momentum, in which you speed up in the smaller circle and slow down in the larger. Like an ice skater pulling arms and legs in to speed up and stretch out to slow down. How does midnight sun in the south work in this model? Why is the sun much higher than observed in winter? Why don't level of sunlight in winter match observed data? How does the sun and the moon speed up and slow down? What drives the sun, the moon and the stars? The stars have always fascinated people. From our perspective they seem to roll over us like the inside of a barrel. 
The stars have also been the means of navigation for millennia, especially the fixed points of the North Star and the Southern Cross. On the Flat Earth model it should be a relatively easy task to calculate the height of the North Star, if the star is close. To do this we need to make some observations, and using simple trigonometry, finding the angle to the North Star is a familiar activity for anyone using a celestial telescope on an equatorial mount north of the equator. This is how you align the telescope, if this do not work in the Flat Earth model, either all astronomers in the world, professional and amateur, have no clue where in the world they are, or the Flat Earth model is rubbish. So, to confirm the North Star actually is right above the North Pole we make observations equidistant on opposite sides of the pole, we make one near Oslo in Norway, and one just north of Homer, Alaska, and confirm the angle is 60 degrees from both sides. At a 60 degrees elevation from Oslo we can calculate the height to 5768 kilometers. We make another observation from Milan in Italy and find the star at just over 45 degrees, and calculate the height of the star to be 5032 kilometers. Very strange, it cannot be refraction causing the difference. Refraction, if there was any would put the observation from Italy above the one from Oslo. We make another observation from Long Year Bien on Svalbard in Norway. We find the star at 78 degrees elevation and height of the star to be 9805 kilometers. Remember how we found the sun was no longer visible from Mexico at 40 degrees elevation at a distance just under 10,000 kilometers, and apparent size of 17 arc minutes? How is this star, a tiny dot in the sky, not even an arc second wide, visible at roughly the same distance? Let us try one more observation, this time much further south. We make an observation from Kano in Nigeria. We find the North Star at an elevation of 12 degrees. Distance from Kano to the North Pole is 8,673 kilometers. That puts the star at an altitude of 1,842 kilometers. With every observation we make we will see a pattern emerging. The lines begin to form a circle. Why is that? It is because these observations are made on a globe. Every one of these are parallel to the axis of rotation. You know, as we are observing from the 45th, 60th and 78th parallel, that is how you determine what latitude you are on, using the elevation of the pole star. This will only work on a globe, thus proving both the globe, and the size of the globe. Since these observations are parallel and pointing to a very distant star, they also prove a very large universe. The direction of south depend on where you are on the flat earth map. Looking south from Africa, South America and Australia is looking in three completely different directions. How can everyone south of the equator see the southern cross due south? Some have suggested everyone has a personal dome off view, some kind of personal star dome. This is a dome 12,000 kilometers wide, and project the stars correctly. I'm sure this kind of pseudo-religious nonsense would pass for wisdom two or three hundred years ago, but not today, not since the invention of photography. Whose personal dome am I using if I connect to and use an unmanned remote telescope, or if I let my telescope take time-lapse photos? When I'm not around? This is just shit for brains make it up as you go along nonsense. How does star navigation work in this model? Why is the North Star a different altitude for every latitude? How do we see the Southern Cross due south in all directions? Why is the Southern Cross a different altitude for every latitude? Whose personal star dome is at play when I use an unmanned remote telescope? Gravity is a big problem in the flat earth model, so of course the claim is simply, gravity don't exist. To explain the tendency objects have to fall they have launched a number of alternatives, of course all quite laughable explanations, 
But let us analyze these one at a time. The candidates are Magnetism or electromagnetism Static electricity and buoyancy Magnetism In the case of magnetism, wouldn't a magnet fall at a different rate than an object that is not magnetic? Most things are not magnetic. Doesn't trees fall in the woods? Or, would not magnets of different polarity fall at different rates? Or at least, wouldn't magnets always fall the same way around? Earth's magnetic field is around 0.6 Gauss. An MRI scanner can be up to 30,000 Gauss. I've been to an MRI examination, and I don't recall gravity being suspended. Not even the most powerful electromagnet we have, at 440,000 Gauss, seem to pose any problem for gravity. I'm sorry, but if you subscribe to this nonsense you simply haven't been thinking this through. Static Electricity When it comes to static electricity one would expect an object that is electrically grounded to fall at a different rate. Like an airship would just fall to the ground once it is grounded for lightning protection. Or, what if we negatively charge one object, wouldn't it just keep floating, like an airship? True enough, the Earth's atmosphere is charged at around 100 volts per meter, but a charge will not do anything until there is some electrical current flowing. The current flow in the atmosphere is so minuscule it has no meaningful effect at all. Besides, the charge in the atmosphere fluctuates daily, with an absolute minimum around 3 a.m. I cannot imagine anyone ever having observed things falling slower at night, though it would be fun if we could make out when a recording was made based on the speed objects are falling. This is the kind of moronic make it up as you go along attitude that is the hallmark of all of this. Sorry, but static electricity won't cut it. Buoyancy. This is where the flat earth idiots really shines. These are really just a bunch of rambling halfwits with no concept of how physics work. I can in all honesty see how you can make this mistake, if you are a child, but to claim you have done your research, and then crawl down this rabbit hole of ignorance and stupidity is just laughable. This often involves some idiot putting a ping pong ball, or an egg in a jar of water to demonstrate buoyancy. Eggs that float in water are not fresh, so you should really throw them out. The obvious fallacy is, when you assume the ball is forcing its way up through the water, if there was no gravity, just buoyancy, the pressure in all the liquid would be uniform. The water would exert the same pressure to all sides of the ball, so where would the ball go, up or sideways, or maybe nowhere, you know, like a ball would behave in a liquid in zero gravity. When we introduce gravity the pressure at the bottom of the jar equals the weight of the water above, at the top of the ball the pressure is slightly lower because there are less water above. Gravity pulls the heavier water down under the lighter ball, and since the pressure is lower above, the ball will rise. Gravity will continue to pull water down under the ball, pushing it up. If you put a much heavier ball into the jar it is the other way around. Gravity will pull the ball down, displacing the water and forcing it up. The same is true for a balloon filled with helium. Gravity will pull the heavier air under the balloon, pushing the balloon up. In a world without gravity there would be no higher pressure deep down in the ocean, and air pressure would be exactly the same all the way up through the atmosphere. The simple fact that air pressure decrease with altitude proves gravity, and that buoyancy is an effect of gravity. Gravity exists and we have a number of ways to observe it, and we can measure the gravitational constant by performing the Cavendish experiment. Thousands of students perform this experiment every year all over the world and have done so for decades, as this instructional movie from the 70s show. Today we have standardized and more accurate instruments to perform the experiment. But this is not a black box of magic tricks. You can use the lead balls from the apparatus and do the experiment with a torsion bar, 
Just like the instructional film from the 70s, the Cavendish apparatus consists of two pairs of spheres, each pair forming dumbbells that have a common swivel axis. One dumbbell is suspended from a quartz fiber and is free to rotate. The second dumbbell can be swiveled so that each of its spheres is in close proximity to one of the spheres of the other dumbbell. The gravitational attraction between two sets of spheres twists the fiber, and it is the measure of this twist that allows the magnitude of the gravitational force to be calculated. The data from the demonstration can be used to calculate the universal gravitational constant, g. We still have some unanswered questions around gravity, and especially its relation to the other forces in nature, but we can observe and measure gravity. Through experiments we can also calculate the gravity of the Earth. The gravity is subject to the centrifugal force from Earth's rotation and properties in the Earth itself. The actual gravity will vary slightly around the world, but it is pretty close to 9.8 meters per second squared. Earth is spinning at 1000 miles per hour. Every hour we are moving 67,000 miles around the sun. We whirl around the galaxy at 490,000 miles per hour. Acceleration and deceleration would be tremendous as we spin and we would be flung into space. And yet we don't feel anything. But this is not the speed of the Earth. This is. One thousand miles per hour is just a number. One thousand six hundred kilometers per hour is a larger number but still the same speed, as is 0.12 earth diameters per hour, and 0.04 circumference per hour, and 0.00001 astronomical units per hour. The question is, does it make any difference whether you are traveling at 60 miles per hour on a train, or 10 times that speed on a plane? If you were to go in very tight circles you would definitely have some problems. But what if that plane is following the Tropic of Cancer, a circle with a diameter roughly the size of the globe? Would the centrifugal forces pin you to the wall inside the plane? What if that plane was going at 1350 miles, or 2180 kilometers per hour? Would you be flung out of the windows of the plane? If this was true, no jet airliner could turn inside the flat earth map. Let's look at another example. Imagine your car is going down the road at 90 km per hour. Your tire is rotating at 714 revolutions per minute. At the point it is contacting the road the tire is doing 0 km per hour. But at the top it is moving forward at 180 km. Does your tire experience tremendous acceleration and deceleration as it revolves? If it did, it would be shredded to pieces immediately. The tire is a frame of inertial reference, meaning it is moving at a constant velocity with zero net force acting on it. To the tire it makes no difference if it is going down the road, or is stationary on a roller. The tire experience a centrifugal force as it spins. The acceleration force on the tire is more than 1800 meters per second squared. But what centrifugal acceleration would it feel if it is going at 0.0067 revolutions per minute at 8 centimeters or 3 inches per hour? This is exactly how fast the earth is spinning. 0.04 circumference per hour at 0.0067 revolutions per minute. Centrifugal acceleration is 0.03137 meters per second squared. Compared to the Earth's 9.8 meters per second squared gravity you will not feel anything. Going at 1000 miles per hour does not matter. The only thing that makes any difference are angular velocity and centrifugal acceleration. As you can see, the centrifugal force is insignificant. Gas cannot be next to vacuum without a container. I really think, some get confused by their own language. Vacuum is not the same as suction. Vacuum in this context is nothing. Vacuum is just a spaced void of matter. Let us clear this up for those who don't quite comprehend the concepts of physics and math. 
Pressure in outer space is about 1 times 10 to minus 4th. 2. Less than 3 times 10 to minus 15th Pascal. So what does this mean? Some obviously think, because there is a minus in the exponent, these are really big negative numbers, and that the last number is a really really, really big negative number. But negative pressure don't exist. The minus in the exponent only mean these are very small numbers. 10 to minus 4th, simply tell you to put 4 zeros, before the number. And the 10 to minus 15th, tell you to put 15 zeros, before the number. Converted to normal decimal numbers, they look like this. In atmospheric pressure, 3 times 10 to minus 15th Pascal, mean, 0.3 atmospheric particles per cubic meter. So, in other words, vacuum in this context is nothing. And of course something can be next to nothing, atmosphere can be next to nothing just fine. It is however gravity that holds the atmosphere to our globe, it is gravity that creates pressure off one atmosphere at sea level, or 1013 hectopascal, this pressure is the weight of the atmosphere above us. The clear evidence for this is the decreasing pressure as we move up through the atmosphere, if it was, as suggested, just buoyancy, the pressure would be uniform all the way up through the uniform gas. At about 100 kilometers we draw the imaginary line we call the Kármán line. This is the edge of space, but as you can see from the pressure of 0.032 Pascal, there are still atmospheric gas outside this line. Take a look at this beautiful image of the sun setting beneath the earth showing how the atmosphere is thinning out. And this one showing a sunset in the atmosphere over the Aleutian Islands. No, vacuum is not the same as suction. Vacuum is nothing. And something can be next to nothing. It is gravity holding our atmosphere in place clearly evidenced by the thinning of the atmosphere at altitude. I cannot see the curve, so the world is flat. This is actually so blindingly stupid we will have to take this step by step. I can see how you can make this mistake, but again, claiming to have done my research. And not being able to think in three dimensions and falling down this pit of ignorance is just incredible. Now, imagine you are standing in a boat mid-ocean, looking out across the water towards the horizon. Not accounting for refraction you will see around 4.7 kilometers, or 2.9 miles. The numbers are not important here. You then look to your right, where you might expect to see the earth is curving slightly downward. But wait, the distance you're now looking at is 6.5 kilometers, 4 miles away. You see, your horizon is not a straight line perpendicular to your line of sight. Your horizon is a circle around you 4.7 kilometers away from you, and all the ocean have fallen away by equal amount. Let us draw this on a globe for clarity. As you turn around your horizon describes a circle around you and the same amount of curve have affected your line of sight in all directions. As our viewpoint gets lower, we can see that the line is straightening, because all along your horizon the ocean is at the exact same level. Looking at the horizon line from the perspective of the viewer, the horizon is completely flat. The height from your eyes down to the horizon is the same in all directions, and that is why you will not see curvature. Only from a very high vantage point will you see the curvature of the horizon, and since the earth is very big the vantage point must be very high. You can however see the curvature in a straight line going towards the horizon, like a very long bridge or a very straight and long shoreline. You can also clearly see the curvature of the earth when objects are partially hidden, like islands, towers and windmills or ships disappearing over the horizon.
When you present clear photographic evidence of this type you tend to get the same reaction over and over again. It is shot with a fisheye lens. Space don't exist. Or, it is refraction. However back here in the real world of thinking rational people, we have this image of the curvature taken from the Galileo spacecraft in 1992. And this beautiful picture of the entire Earth taken from Galileo at an altitude of 1.5 million miles in 1990. This image was taken from the ISS in 2014, using a Nikon D3S with 80mm lens. And this one using the same camera and 85mm focal length. So, back to Earth. As I said, looking at a very long bridge stretching towards the horizon, like the longest one in the US, the Lake Pontchartrain Causeway, you can clearly see the curvature of the Earth. Can you see the curvature in this image of the Suez Canal? Or in this image? Or in this one, also showing an excellent mirage. Or in this one where we happen to have the actual distances to the ships. Curvature is impossible to see from left to right, except from a high vantage point. We can see curvature in lines going towards the horizon. Or when viewing objects partially hidden by curvature. Airplanes don't constantly adjust for curvature. Yes, they do. Please educate yourself on how airplanes and airplane navigation works. Airplane wings are shaped to make air move faster over the top of the wing. When air moves faster, the pressure of the air decreases and the wings lift the airplane. Since the air pressure is decreasing with higher altitude, an airplane will fly at a certain altitude for a given speed. If the airplane wants to go higher it must increase its lift, by flying at a higher speed. If there was no gravity, just buoyancy, as some have suggested, the air pressure would be uniform all the way up through the atmosphere. Altitude would be impossible to control and the airplane would skyrocket or plummet with every gust of wind. Any asymmetric force on the plane would send the plane into a roll. Without gravity, and decreasing air pressure in the atmosphere, the plane would be almost uncontrollable, and the pilot would have to constantly aim the plane at the correct altitude and direction. Following the curvature of the Earth is simply maintaining level flight. It is the equilibrium of speed, air pressure, gravity and lift that keeps the airplane at altitude. The aerodynamic properties of the airplane holds the aircraft perpendicular to the gravity vector. When the aircraft is subjected to gusts of wind, turbulence or downdrafts, it is the task of the pilot or the systems in the airplane to correct altitude and level. So, following the curve of the earth is simply maintaining level flight. Several flat earthers have challenged anyone to show actual computer code that does adjustments for curvature in an airplane. ArduPilot is one of the most used software packages in drones for agricultural and geological surveys, where long distance flights often occur. The software is completely open source, so we can inspect the code. These few lines from the source code of ArduPilot is the code that actually does the adjustments for changes in altitude and earth curvature on long flights. You can check this out for yourself at GitHub. Aerodynamics holds an aircraft perpendicular to the gravity vector. Equilibrium of speed, air pressure, gravity and lift keeps an airplane at altitude. Following the curvature of the earth is simply maintaining level flight. The earth is flat, because the bible says so. For several flat earthers, this is the last defense, when other arguments crumble. No, it don't. Besides, 
Holding up the Bible as the answer is hardly an argument as it got all of these subjects completely wrong. Here is a great example of how wrong and goes to show these stories was made up around a campfire in the arid deserts of the Middle East by men who knew very little. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. The creation of heaven and earth according to the first book of Moses called Genesis. But where did God get the oxygen to make water before he made the stars? This whole flat earth idea is just a big mess. Nothing works in this model. No observation fit in this stupid hypothesis. The proponents of this idea are just a bunch of illiterate idiots. A group of underachievers who simply doesn't have the mental capacity to understand any science. So they make up some nonsense to seem wise and important. If you have some insight in one subject, and you hear someone who doesn't have a clue, talking about the subject, you immediately hear from their wording that they are clueless. That is what these flat earthers are, clueless about maths, physics, geography, geology, oceanography, cartography, biology, meteorology, history, navigation, aviation and astronomy, to mention a few subjects, basically casting out 2500 years of knowledge. Like Mr. Bob Nodal who tried to debunk earth rotation with a $20,000 ring laser gyroscope and ended up proving 15 degree rotation per hour. Or what do you say Bob? A 15 degree per hour drift. Or one of their greatest heroes, the flat earth Jesus Christ, Mr. Eric DeBay, who obviously can't read, can't do math and know nothing about physics. He just google a lot of words he can't even pronounce let alone understand and make a word salad. Like his embarrassing video, 200 proofs the world is flat, 200 ways to totally misunderstand the natural world would have been a much better title. To Mr. Dubé and his stupid evidence I would only say this. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. So, please, if you have fallen for this idiotic idea, try to think for yourself. Try to educate yourself in subjects like physics, astronomy or just simple navigation, and make some observations. And if you have donated money to these clowns, or worse, paid for any of their publications, do yourself a favor and demand your money back, right now.